All praise to God, and of course, the round of applause is for the Lord, and of course, God's people, thank you, First Bible Baptist Church peoples, uh, God's servants, thank you. Some beautiful pictures out there, somebody was wandering around all week long, I don't know, uh, I don't know, she did pretty good, Mr. Houston, she did all right. The whole crew was tremendous, and I'm very thankful for everyone that served, everyone that participated, and of course, all those children, they received hugs every day and of course that's the drink that we use the hugs of course but they also got little hugs and a little bit of love and they heard about the Lord Jesus Christ they had great Bible stories every day and and they had a, a neat way of learning a Bible verse for the second year in a row uh, last time of course we did it was 19 the second time we did uh, Brenda Dawson put together a song so they could memorize Isaiah 40 verses 30 and 31 what a great way to learn the Bible, and it was strong, and it was so good. Go to Galatians 5, so very thankful to the Lord, and how he has uh, put those things in our heart from the Word, and, and uh, as I used a closing illustration with our team uh, on Saturday, uh, excuse me, on Friday as we were finishing up, I said, you know, Jesus sat uh, a few thousand people down at two different instances to feed them, and then the disciples were the beneficiaries of some great lessons from Jesus Christ. And uh, they then individually were compelled and had to go out with the same assignment. And that's what happens sometimes. We're good with the corporate and the collective events and the gatherings, which are, which are good and they're necessary in, in our mission work that God has called us to do. But there's a personal calling on every one of us, and that's for us to be the gospel witnesses of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in that calling, there's also another calling, and you're called to the liberty that uh, you have been saved in through the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to talk about that this morning out of Galatians chapter number 5. I didn't bring my clicker, so you can hang in there and hang with me, and we'll, we'll figure this thing out. Um, through the first few verses as we started into chapter 5, I mentioned something very important, I believe, uh, two or three weeks ago, is that this is one of those New Testament chapters that's essential to you having uh, really a, a strong growth in the Lord. Uh, there may be some verses for some of you that have been saved for a while that you memorize two or three or four verses out of this chapter, like cha uh, verse number one, or maybe uh, in the Spirit, uh, memorizing uh, the fruit of the Spirit in verses 22 and 23. Maybe you've memorized verse 16. Maybe you've memorized verse number 25. There's some great great doctrinal stuff in here, but most of all, Paul is giving the churches of Galatia, the believers at Galatia, some practical application of what he's covered in those last two chapters of three and four when we talked about how he brought us the grace message in six places of how it is by grace that we serve, by grace that we're saved. So two weeks ago, we looked at stand before you walk, and then Last week, we looked at what it means to be hindered. Uh, let's do a couple little highlights. We'll, we'll look at highlights in chapter number five for a moment. Uh, the first one is verse number one. And of course, if you have your Bibles open, you can see it. But it says there up on the screen as well, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. That is one of our highlights. We, again, preached through those first few verses a couple of weeks ago. And we looked at this principle. Hey, sometimes we want to get into the walk. And we want to start running. And there's no child in the world that ever started walking and running before they crawled. And before they learned how to stand. You're a child in the Lord. You're growing spiritually. You need to learn how to stand. And what do you stand on? You stand fast, therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. He is telling them very simply, hey, brethren, if you start getting stuck on that stuff that you did when you were lost because this flesh has an insatiable appetite, and if you do not go after what the Holy Spirit of God has for you in the Word of God, then this flesh will win the battle all the time. And you'll be back in a place where even though you know you're saved, you're born again, you called in the name of the Lord to save you, you're now stuck in this carnal life of yoke, of bondage, and you need to get that thing sorted out again. And 
That's where your pastors are here for you, your shepherds, people that disciple others to say, hey, I can walk with you through this and I can show you what it means to not live in that place of the yoke of bondage all over again as if you were lost. And then the other highlight I wanted you to make sure and see is in Galatians chapter number 5, verse number 7, which was the beginning verse of our passage last week. You did run well. You were doing well. Who did hinder you? That you should not obey the truth. So many illustrations come to mind when you're reminded of the meaning of the word hinder. When you're hindered, you're pushed back. You're set back. When you're troubled, when somebody troubles you, they're bringing commotion that hits you internally. When people bewitch you or someone bewitches you, that's a devilish thing that is evil. And so who troubled you? Who did hinder you? Who bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth? Paul is saying, look, you ran well for a while, but then you were hindered. Then you were stopped. Then you were pushed back. It was kind of like that crazy storm Friday. Um, that, was, that was some strong wind out there. And uh, trying to open up the exit entry door here in the south, I go up and down there because my office is over here. And so I thought, let me try and push that thing open. And I was like, mm. and then I, well, let me, I thank God that I couldn't open it. And I had it open that much, and it wham, slammed back because the wind hindered me from opening the door. It pushed me back. And you need to heed that warning of what's pushing you back. The illustration spiritually is very simple. The lies, the propagation of the false gospel, the legalism, the idea that you can live in a place where now that you're saved, you don't have to live in the liberty, you can live in the license for your flesh to be fed, that's not what God would have for you, and you end up being hindered away from the truth. Paul's giving great warning as we look at the highlights of the first 12 verses. Well, this morning, we're going to look at Galatians 5, verses 13 through 18, and see again. I was going to really take a big chunk out of this, but as the, the days went on, I went, wait a minute, there's too much here. In just these simple six verses. And then we'll cover the balance of the chapter next week when we look at verses 19 through 26. But Galatians 5, 13 through 18, there's a lot here as well. I mentioned chapter 5 has a lot of good stuff in it. Again, an essential chapter to me, one of the big ones in the, of course all of them are, but a really big one when it comes to learning how to know the will of God, learn what it means to live in the liberty in Christ, learn how truly that you are saved by grace, you serve by grace, and it's not the law that compels you. In fact, when you get saved, God, God through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit of God comes into you, you've got all the law set in you. And now you're free to just walk in sweet obedience because you are a child of God. You're a son of God. Let's read verses 13 through 18 down through and get a little bit of context. That was a little bit of historical setting of where we're at in this message today as we looked at the last two. Now here is our third message out of Galatians 5, starting in verse number 13. Another verse that many of you may have memorized. For brethren, meaning of course he's talking to believers, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not your liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Verse 14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love the Lord, thy, excuse me, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Try to interject the other verse. No. Of course, the first time, and you see it over in the book of Leviticus, you see it in other places in the Old Testament, to love thy neighbor as thyself. You'll see also in the New Testament that is mentioned the same context the same verse the same principle eight other times in the new testament so god's serious about love thy neighbor as thyself why do i stop and pause there look at verse 15 now this is a tough one why in the world does the holy spirit of god by the hand of paul put this verse in here but if ye bite and devour one another take heed that ye be not consumed one of another Boy, that's a strong illustration. 
Animals, when they are in the woods and they're fighting one another, they bite and devour one another to survive. It's a survival instinct of an animal to do that. And so that's the context, the connotation here is that, hey, brethren, but if you bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. We'll break it down a little bit more here in a moment. Verse number 16, 17, and 18 now, talking of what happens to you as a believer. You call on the name of the Lord to save you. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. Not of yourselves, as a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Religious people, like all of us at one time, maybe even still in our place, go, yeah, I can just do enough good things, and then I, God, I'll earn your favor, and if you never call on the name of the Lord to save you by faith, then his grace will never act upon your life in that salvation experience, and then you miss out on 16, 17, and 18. Hey, all of you that are Christians, you're believers here this morning, you have the Holy Spirit of God in you. You are a vessel. You are the house. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And so it says in verse 16, 17, and 18, mentioning the Spirit four times, three times, four times, it says there, walk in the Spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Verse 17, for the flesh lusteth against the Spirit. And the spirit against the flesh. That means the spirit lusts for the things of God, which is a good thing, while the flesh lusteth of the things to feed it. They war against one another. The word contrary comes up. These are contrary one to another, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the spirit, Ye are not under the law, led by the Spirit. Now think of this for a moment. In reading that text, maybe it won't be such a stretch when you see up on the screen, hey, do you or do we give control every day to someone else? Yes, in fact, daily we give control over to someone or something to lead our decisions. So who are you led by? You know that. You wake up in the morning, say you're going to have devotion time, and then you have a little bit of time. If that doesn't take root, the Word of God, the Spirit of God, then guess what you got? A day where the only thing you're living off of is what maybe a stale spiritual meal that you have, a preaching message you heard, maybe a podcast, maybe a a message, something, and you're saying, okay, but when you say, God, I want you to control my thoughts. God, I want your word and the things of your word to control my decisions. Then, hey, I'm in that good place of having God lead me and direct me. But daily, every one of us, we give control to somebody. We give control to someone. We give control to something to lead our decisions. Remember, out there, there's a lot of things against you. There's a lot of people against you. This world is against you. In fact, they want to take over your mind and your thoughts and your heart and your will and your desires and say, hey, I'm going to control what you're thinking about. I want to have a way. In fact, it's very, very simple. When you turn on television or other programs or things, they have an agenda. And they would like to develop your thinking process for the way that you will make decisions. Who's they? Anybody that's in the powers of the spirit of this world being operated upon and operated through by the prince of the power of this air that wants to spiritually mess with us. So what belief system directs our decisions each day? Is it your license because now you're born again? You're my brother and sister in the Lord. You're a son of God. And you say, hey, I'm free. Bible says once I get saved, I have eternal security, that's good, so now I have a license to do whatever I want and God will still love me. Interesting thinking. But some of us live that way. Some of us at different times say, yeah, God won't mind. God will be okay with it. I'll just tell him I'm sorry, he'll forgive me. Bible says if I confess with my mouth, 
the Lord Jesus and get saved, then I'm good there. I, I, I did, so I, I needed Jesus Christ. I got saved, and everything is good. Okay, now, he also says, hey, if you can confess your sins to me, he's faithful and just to forgive. And since I got saved, all he wants me to do is just, just make things right. Well, yes, it's a powerful truth in the word of God because once Jesus Christ comes in to be your savior, your sins are forgiven. And the distance that happens to you and me in the broken fellowship, yes, that can always be made right as we go to the Father. But what's that license do for me? It puts me in a place where I feed my flesh. Legalism, to look at the place where I say, hey, I'm gonna choose legalism. I'm gonna have people watch my actions. I'm gonna make sure that I please others. And I'm gonna make sure that in all that I do, I'm gonna do it and hopefully God will be really pleased and look down at me and see things. But hey, if I just obey the right kind of rules and the right kind of people see me, then they'll approve of my life. There is so much anti-Jesus Christ action going on around us every day. There's spiritual wickedness in high places. There are so much false teaching. And Paul's warned us against that. The spirit of this world is wicked. The spirit of this beautiful word is powerful and alive and true. And he's filled with truth. A couple of Verses that we already read. This I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now I know that verse was written for everyone else around you but not you. It was written for those people that are brethren that are the Galatians. No, it's for you and me. If you walk in the Spirit, then you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Right now, the Holy Spirit of God, that's what I pray that he's doing because he does it in me. It says in verse number 18, but if ye be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. That means you are born again, you're being led by the Spirit, he's at work in you, and you're saying, hey, I don't need to obey the law to make God pleased. In fact, I could not. Paul's covered that. He said, hey, okay, one point of the law, cover all the law, obey all the law. You can't, and now you're back in bondage again. Like he said in verse number seven, you did run well for a while, then you grabbed some of that legalistic thinking, you thought, okay, if I obey the law and do it in the flesh, and I, and I get everything in the right clicking order, and I check some this, and I check them that, and I do the list, and I, he says, you and I have been hindered that we should not obey the truth. So let me ask you this simple question for our introduction. Why is it so common for us to suppress the fruit of the Spirit of God, the leading of the Holy Spirit of God, the liberty that we're called to from the Spirit of God through Jesus Christ, and the power that's found in the Holy Spirit? You see, that's everything right here. In these 26 verses of chapter number 5. Why is it so common for us to say, I'm going to suppress that power, the power of the Spirit of God that works through the Word of God by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one that doesn't need any tension. He is the one of the Trinity who doesn't, he's, he's always just operated in the quiet. He is taught by Jesus Christ to his disciples, so we learn how he is the comforter. He is the teacher. He is the reprover. He is the director and the leader of our actions if we would allow him. He is the fruit bearer in our lives. He gives us the ability to fulfill the calling and liberty in Jesus Christ by working in that. Why would we suppress that? Suppress the fruit of the Lord, fruit of the Spirit of God. The word suppression very simply means to put down something by authority. To put down someone by force. Which basically means simply this. When you and I decide to quench the Spirit, when we decide to grieve the Holy Spirit of God that's in us and sealing us and caring for us, we are suppressing or saying, hey, I'm the authority today. You're not the authority, God. And I'm going to suppress the power that you could do in me 
to speak, to act, to walk like Jesus Christ. When it says in Romans chapter number 8 that God's not fooling around here. That he wants to conform you to the image of Jesus Christ. Do you really think he wants another one of me? Another one of you? He wants more of those that look like his son, Jesus Christ. His original meaning for every one of us. When he made us, was to be conformed to the image of Christ. And that final part of our sanctification will end in glorification. And we will behold him. And when we do, and we'll become in the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, fulfilled completely. Why would I want to suppress that going on right now? Because I love my flesh more than I love God. Let's be straight now. This is a, a big girl and big boys class today. Because I love my flesh more than I love God. It's a matter of love. And I'll fool him some way by doing a few rules or maybe even taking my license to sin in my own diabolical thinking and think that he's going to be okay with it because he's already forgiven me. Yes, God has forgiven you, but he's not okay with his child living like that. It's not hard to figure out that the title of our message might be Suppressed Power. What do we do? We take the power of God within us. It's the same as taking the beautiful words of God and saying, those are nice, but I need to put those down. I, I don't need those anymore. It's the same thing. He's the spirit of the living God. He's God Almighty. And Paul's saying, hey, a little less than 2,000 years ago, he wrote that in around 54 OED, and he said, hey, Galatians, hey, brethren, do you know what you're getting yourself into here? Who bewitched you? Who hindered you? Who troubled you? Why would you go down that pathway that's going to make your life miserable? You're my child. I have something for you that's so very beautiful. It's my son, Jesus Christ, to be like him in the Holy Spirit. When we covered the first few verses, we outlined this, so I just want to give you a quick review. We looked at the refusal to obey the command. What's the command? Verse number one. And what happens? Well, we looked at four different things that can happen in your life when you do not obey or you refuse to obey that command of standing fast. In the liberty. We then looked at last week in our outline and just our historical doctrine teaching out of the passage six different characteristics of false teachers. There's a lot of those different characteristics that come and they're obvious, like they're not of God, they'll hinder you, they will be judged for their heresy later on as he deals with that. But sometimes it's hard to pick up on a false teacher unless. You're relying on the Word of God and the Spirit of God to make it clear. And then this week and next week, it'll be part one and part two of license, liberty, or legalism. So today I just want to cover part one for a few minutes, and then we'll take the practical teachings of Paul, and we'll bring them to a place of practical application for ourselves. You see... When you look at this context, you realize something really, really strong, and that's this. Legalism, either, either in a way that's you know, really extreme and, and really strong or just a few little places, as much as also license, neither one of them do nothing more than pander to your flesh. They help you feel good about your flesh. They make you feel like, hey, God must be happy with me. Or God's going to be okay with me, as I mentioned earlier. They just pander to your flesh. The liberty in Christ, Paul is saying, hey, I don't want you to even think about the licensed part or the legalistic part. I just want you to settle in what you've been called to. 
brethren, you've been called unto liberty, it says in verse number 13. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, which is simply a military word that says, hey, this is our gathering or our our gathering spot, our our, our center place, our, our, our camp uh, safe ground where will we go from there. We want to use this occasion to then go. It's the way we gather or we end up coming together and having a unity there. Well, is that the way I want to look at my flesh? Hey, let me use it for an occasion, my liberty, for an occasion to the flesh. No, he says, I want you to love one another and serve one another by love. He's saying also too there with that battle there that it is a law versus love fight. That it is a contrast. It is a fight about what you have and I have and our freedoms. We've been called into liberty. We have liberty and freedom in the Lord. We're free to obey. We're free to obey out of love. We're free from eternal punishment. We're free from the spirit of fear. We're called by the Lord to be able to live in a place where we just love to do that which he would have us to do. He's saying you have freedom to all those things, but you don't have freedom from moral constraint. You don't have freedom to say, again, that I'm going to feed my flesh morality-wise, just do what I want to do. You know what? Your liberty does not promote either license or legalism. It simply promotes a relationship with the Lord through the word of God, by the spirit of God. And you and I are called unto it. The word simply means called an invitation. I invite you to something. I give you a name. I give a name to something. You've been called. Called to what? Called to liberty. And the Holy Spirit of God wants to work that in you and wants to show you in that. And then he says, hey, something else in this text that I want you to see. And when you see that, that wrestling and that fighting out of verse number 15, and I mentioned a little bit of it, hey, hey, watch out, church. Watch out where you can go. Watch out, believer, individually where you can go. Because when it really comes down to it, We have appetites in our flesh that sometimes are unsatiable. And if they're left unchecked by the word and by the spirit of God, whoo, the Holy Spirit of God will have no control. You say, well, God can put me on my back anytime. Yes, he can. But God in his way has put the word of God before you, the Holy Spirit of God before you. He sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, It's like that old joke when the person gets to heaven and he says, what happened? I was praying and you never said, I sent you a boat, I sent you a helicopter. And he's standing on top of the roof trying to find a way to get out of the awful storm that he was in. God says, I I sent everything you you needed. I gave you everything that you needed. Are you going to choose the law or are you going to choose the love that you're to have? And then as he continues down here, he talks about walking the spirit. You won't fulfill the lust of the flesh, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit. There's a constant, constant contest. And it's not a good competition, but it's real. It is a real competition. And the flesh sets its desires up against the spirit. The Holy Spirit of God doesn't wake up in the morning and say, oh, I'm going to have a fight with the flesh. The flesh wakes up in the morning when you get out of bed and says, I'm going to fight Holy Spirit God. I'm going to fight against what God wants you to do. And there's not a person in here who's born again who wouldn't attest to that. The flesh sets itself against the Holy Spirit. And it says there in verse number 16, when you walk in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Well, that simply means this. A person that walks in the Spirit is filled with the Spirit. We're always trying to find some formula in the kitchen, at the oven, or, or maybe we go out and we talk to some people. What's it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Read your Bible and pray every day and you'll grow, grow, grow. And some more, and some more, and stay with it, and some more. And now you'll start thinking like Jesus. You'll start living like Jesus. 
the Holy Spirit of God will be filling up your vessel, the person, the person of you. And understand that the person of you that God saved with your soul, your heart, your mind, your strength, your everything that you are, he embodies all of it. But the flesh, on the other hand, says, I'm going to contest against that. The desire of the Holy Spirit is to practically restore you, I said this earlier, to the image of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit empowers us. He enables us to do this. But not without the resistance of your flesh. Your flesh is going to resist. That's what it says there. Look at verse number 17 in detail. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. It is real. It is so real that I believe we've just been hypnotized into believing, oh, that's not really going on. Let's just watch another movie. We've got these spiritualism things that are messing with our minds, not realize that there's a spiritual warfare here. The power of the Holy Spirit will empower you and me and enables me. And he enables you. He enables us to resist the flesh. But if you say, no, 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 I've got license. That does not please God. Sorry, nowhere, no how, you could find that in the Bible to tell me it's okay to do whatever you want and that'll be, God will be okay with it. That is not the truth. You have been fooled, and you have been hindered, and you've been bewitched, and you're no different, and I'm no different than the people at Galatia who were fooled and hindered. Church, we've got a big assignment. It's the same assignment that was given them back then. And he says in verse number 18, but if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Why? Because Jesus Christ fulfilled all the law. So in Jesus Christ, you don't have to say, if I obey the rules today, if I become a more spiritual person, if I'm, I'm just a great admirer of the religious pastor people around, you know what? I now have submitted myself to the cool religious system. I'm good. Or I can say this. I believe I have the strength to obey and improve myself. I'm working on it. I do what I am, and I, I am what I do, and I measure up to the standards that I've set by myself. So I've got legalism and I've got license and neither one of them do anything else but feed my flesh. And you and I know it. It's the truth of the word of God. It's not the truth of Mark Brown. No matter how you look at it, legalism is an, is as insidious, a dangerous enemy as you and I taking on our flesh to live in wicked sin. And Paul the Apostle's dealing with that, and that's what we're looking at. Because what happens is we suppress the power of the living God within us. Let me just give you three simple things here in the next few minutes that really take this passage, I believe, and show us that the Holy Spirit really wants control. Because that's what he's saying. When God says to you and me, I want it all, he's not goofing around. He wants it all, and he deserves it. Not me telling you that I want it all. No. God says, I want all of you. How, why is that so hard for us? Why is it so hard for me? Because I have flesh that wants all of itself. And there's, look, you can look at the principle of putting on and putting off and just kind of scan over it. It's an incredible principle from the word of God in Ephesians and Colossians, it's just a couple places. But when you put on Christ, when you put on that new garment of him every day, spiritually speaking, when you put on the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm telling you what, the Holy Spirit of God now says, wow, you're giving me control. I love it because that's what I desire because I know what's best for you. In fact, I know what's right for you. I don't know just what's best for you. I know what's right for you. The Holy Spirit of God desires that control. So what's the first place that it works? I believe this is the first one. The Holy Spirit control means there is a powerful force, him, in our calling, verse number 13, to liberty, to love others the Jesus way. Sometimes we do not do love with our brothers and sisters in the Lord like Jesus Christ did it. 
And I only go by what the Word of God says. When we get the first 10 verses of chapter number 6, you can just sit there and look at that real quick. It's not far away. Brethren, if a man be overcome in a fault, which your spirits will restore. Hey, let's see if we can work on that relationship. Verse number 2, bear one another's burdens. That takes love. For if a man think himself something, when he is nothing, he deceives him. I mean, everything here. Everything. It's about love. Verse number eight. For thou hast so as his flesh and weak, because be not deceived, God is not mocked. He's talking about this relationship we have with him. And there's powerful force. The Holy Spirit of God is in you and me. And in the calling of what we have in Jesus and our liberty. Free. I'm free in Jesus Christ to love others the Jesus way. Yeah, we get a little sideways at different times. I joke about it a little bit. I, I'd like to believe in, in my uh, tiny little mind that everybody really loves me and I'm really lovable, you know. I, yeah, I'd like to think that. But in the Holy Spirit of God, we all are. We really are. We can't love that way. We love one another because the Holy Spirit of God has been given permission by you and me to say, hey, I can lead you into loving that person. I can lead you in a place where you'll know. The Bible teaches us, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You see that phrase, one another, verse number 13. You see, again, when you say, verse number 14, thou shalt love thy neighbor, verse number 15. Hey, if you bite and devour one another, and take heed that ye not be consumed by one of another, by the way, that would be a cool camp theme, one another, because that's pointing to the truth of what the Holy Spirit of God does in us. I love when I see you guys loving on each other. It's awesome, because I know that's God at work in you. We're all different. We all have different mixes. We don't say the things we ought to say in the times that we used to say. We say them the wrong way. But when you add liberty and love together, you're able to serve one another. If you say, okay, I have liberty, but then I take the love out, guess what? I got a license to do whatever I want, and now I serve out of duty. I serve out of obligation. I serve just to get it done. It says up on the screen there in Colossians chapter number one, a great, a great place of teaching what Paul was doing with that church at Colossae to remind them of the preeminence of Christ. They had some good stuff. They distanced themselves from Christ and they needed to be reminded. It says in verse number four of chapter one in Colossians, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have for all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the, of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, bringeth forth fruit as it do doth also in you, since the day ye heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. So they heard of it. He heard of it. He heard of it. And as it becomes very specific here. I learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, verse 8, who also declared unto you us, excuse me, declared unto us your love in the Spirit. That's evidence of the Holy Spirit working, and your love is in the Spirit. Not the love in your flesh, but the love in your spirit. The love in your flesh just temporarily hangs around. The lust that comes in your flesh gets in the way of the love of the Spirit, and the fruit of the Spirit, again, is suppressed. It says in 1 Peter, chapter number one, up on the screen, verse number 22, I believe I got it, do I have it up there? Oh, I don't. Then guess what? It's not on the screen. I'm going to have to read it. 1 Peter 1.22. Seeing ye have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. That's 1 Peter 1.22. He says in verse number 23, Being born again not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. That's the love from the truth of the Spirit of God. It's an unfeigned love of the brethren. Peter wrote that as well. You see, when you and I get to a place where we think, you know what, I can just get by this week. I can fool everybody into telling them. That only lasts for a certain period of time. And then after a while, you are worn out. 
And then in your flesh, which dwelleth no good, the Holy Spirit of God being suppressed in his power, you're barely liking yourself. Never mind loving your brothers and sisters in the Lord. So the first place in which I believe that the Holy Spirit is saying I need control is in how we love one another and serve one another. The second one I believe that is coming out of the scriptures is Holy Spirit control means there is a powerful force in our calling to override our sinful lusts. How in the world, pastor, do I get over this fleshly, lustful desire to do such and such and such and such and such and such? It's the word of God, the spirit of God in you, believer, in you yielding, as the Bible teaches in Romans 6 and other places, that I will overcome it for you if you allow me to have place in your life. You say, that's pretty basic. I've learned that many times. Then how is it that we go back to sin in the flesh with our arrogance and our pride in thinking that we've got something conquered when he's the one who wants to conquer it when we say, yes, Lord, I need work in that. The old phrase I used to hear from old preachers was, yeah, just wait till you get older in the Lord. It's going to be even harder to be. You're going to have a harder time living by faith. You're going to have a harder time with your flesh. I went, when I'm old and crotchety, which I already am, I can tell you, it is true. That your flesh has even got more power to resist against the Holy Spirit than ever. It's got experience. But God tells me that he can give me experience in him. And I learn from him. And I grow in him. And then guess what? This powerful force that's in our calling to liberty will then say, hey... It'll override your sinful lust, and all of a sudden you go through two days, three days, four days, five days, and you're not even walking down that road of that lustful thing that you used to run down. That's what God does through his Holy Spirit. And yet, church, we feebly mumble and jumble and barely get through. We go into the, the, the golden years or whatever and realize that our flesh has become lazy. Our flesh has become weary. And we need, to, we need Isaiah 40. <laughs> and we need the song <laughs> about being weary and fainting because God does not get fainted and worried. Except that our sin and our rebellion, as he said in Isaiah 40, 41, 42, it's the only thing. You see, God keeps on saying, I'm for you, my children. I am here for you, and I am going to take care of you, but you need to let me have my way in your life. Oh, Romans chapter number 8. I used verses 3 and 4 a few weeks ago. Let me read, read verses number 1 and 2. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. I love that, don't you? Because there's no condemnation on you once you're born again. You're not condemned. Christ came not into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. The condemnation came from our sin because we tried to fulfill the law in our own flesh. And he says, that's your punishment because you chose that way. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not a works lest any man should boast. He says, guess what you get even more, verse number two. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Done. So walk there. Live there. If you're in a mess, get out. Make a choice to live for Christ. Open up the word. Start in Romans and read it one chapter a day. Two chapters a day, three chapters a day. Just keep on reading the book of Romans. When you get bored there, call Bobby. He's got nothing else to do but sit down and talk with you. There's plenty of people that'll sit down and talk to you about your next step in growing beyond the lustful life of your flesh. And it takes years to understand this. Doesn't it? It takes years to understand the growth, but you've got to stay with it. 
As you have stayed with the lust of your flesh, you ought to stay with the Holy Spirit of God of your liberty in Jesus Christ. We know, I speak from experience, and I speak from the Holy Spirit of God convicting me, but also directing me and teaching me and clearly reproving my life. He says in verse Peter chapter number two, as free, free in Jesus, and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. So it turns you to a place where I'm gonna take what I've been given in this vessel and use it for his glory as a servant of God. And that's what all of you did at VBSC. But who's stopping you from going by yourself out there, wherever you're going to go? You don't need permission to be the servant of God from me or anybody. Go in the Holy Spirit with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Take the word of God that you've learned. If you're not there in a place, ask somebody that is overseeing discipleship. There's plenty of people here that will talk to you. We've got like 300 pastors on staff here. But we also have leaders, men and women that are out in the lobby Just talk to them. Take five minutes. Can I ask you about learning the Bible? And I promise you none of them will say, I don't know what to do. Will you take care of them, David? Janet, will you take care of them? Steve, Mike, will you take care of them? Yes. What can we do to get you to a place where you understand that as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, that you can be a servant of God? Would there be no better way to live your life as a child of God, and to serve him until you take your last breath. The only thing in the way is you and me. Lastly, the Holy Spirit control means there is powerful force inside of you in our calling to tap into his leading the leading of the Holy Spirit of God. I'd like to say that I do this a lot. I don't. There's something about us taking the lead instead of God taking the lead through us. When God takes the lead through us, people go, wow, that that makes sense. I, I, I can see that. I can see the Holy Spirit of God at work. You may not even know that. I was sitting around talking to somebody on Tuesday, and I said, you know, most of the people, and it's good that they don't know, <laughs> they don't even know that it's God in them working. Out there in the workforce, talking to people, it's the Holy Spirit of God bringing to memory. When you testify of how I was able to come up, I was able to come up with a Bible verse that I didn't even know I had. Who was that? The Spirit of the living God bringing into recollection. Oh, I asked this person a question. I don't even know what I said, and it worked out great. Somebody sent me a text yesterday. Hey, where's that thing uh, in the Old Testament about they were all blinded, and then, and then, and then they, got, they wanted to keep them blind, and they opened up their eyes, and there was just chariots and angels, and this person sent me a text. I'm witness to a person, and I don't know what to tell them. Elisha, there's a battle with Israel. God. Send him a text about five minutes later. My point is that, this. I didn't have an answer real quick. I couldn't, I couldn't, remember, the, I couldn't remember where it was. I, I kind of looked up. I was looking for some. Oh, there it is. My point. Simply put, we can tap into the leading of the Holy Spirit or we can tap into our own flesh. You have a choice. I do too. It says in old Romans chapter number seven. Oh, we have to have this before we close out our message in a couple minutes. Here we go. Verse number 17 says in Romans 7, 17 and 18, Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Verse 18, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which, I, which is good I find not. And you know he continues on, For the good that I would do not, but the evil that which I would do... I, Excuse me, I would not, that I do. Now if I do that, I would not. Is it no more that I do it, but sin that dwelleth in me? This is Paul the Apostle writing that. Do you remember? This is not a license. This is an explanation of the war that you have. The lust of the flesh versus the lust of the spirit for what's right. Period. And it's real. 
It happens to you at 30 years old, 40 years old, 60 years old, 80 years old. There's still this wrestling match. And Paul is saying, I find in a law, a principle in life from God's word, that when I would do, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, bringing into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So that with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. The Holy Spirit of God wrote that. And he's inside of you and me. I finish up with this simple passage of scripture up on the screen from Romans 8. You can't miss with this one. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. I've used this in our text and our preaching of this one other time. We are not debtors to this flesh. You owe this flesh nothing. You understand? We don't owe it nothing. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. This flesh, oh. This flesh. You need the power of the living God to overcome this flesh. If you think you can overcome it, then you probably haven't been doing really well with it. <laughs> Personal experience. But when you give God the power that he has already assigned to you and permission to go, he says, I've got you. I'll walk you through that. You'll resist that devil and he'll flee. He'll say, I can't go there. You'll be angry but sin not. You'll let not the sun go down upon your wrath. You will not give place to the devil. Oh, he's dangerous. And of course, Never mind the devil for a minute in this crazy world we live in. All I need to come back to is myself. It says up on the screen to finish. Suppressed power of the Holy Spirit comes from an authority issue in your heart. Sit on that for a minute. Because when you suppress the power, you're saying that you have the authority in your power to force him to be quiet. And he is quenched and he is grieved. That's the Holy Spirit. So the question I have for you this morning, and we'll leave it up on the screen, is this. When will it be time for you to be, as it says in the Bible, in verse number 18, led of, 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 important preposition, led of the Spirit. Led of the Spirit. When will it be time for you and I to be led of the Spirit instead of being led by ourselves? Our Father in heaven, your word is so perfect, it's so reproving, it's true. There's not a lie in it. Your grace is sufficient. Your mercies are new all the time, every day. And you, not to condemn the world, but to save the world, you sent your son, Jesus Christ. You then, in the believer, put the Holy Spirit of God within us. He gave us the living word of God. We have it all. Now I pray for my brothers and sisters in the Lord, as, long as, as well as myself, that God, you would just awaken us, rejuvenate us, put us in a place where we would just simply go, God, this is time to be led of the Spirit instead of being led to fulfill the law. I pray you have your way in this invitation time. In Jesus' name, amen.